yeah, I think that'd be great. Now it's official. Okay. So uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar. Um, we are the AIA Chicago Design for Aging KC. So I'm Drew Roscoe. So I'm a co-chair of the group. Heidi Wang is on, uh, also a co-chair of the group. Uh, and part of our programming this year is uh, this webinar, which is uh, we titled Alternative Aging in Place Typologies, ADUs and In-Law Suites. We have uh, three great panelists today, uh, acting, uh, practicing architects doing ADUs in Chicago proper uh, currently, and, and we're excited to have them um, explain their experiences and uh, lend us some of their learned uh, knowledge. Um, so let's go on. So our uh, learning objectives today, um, uh, a definition of uh, accessory dwelling units, um, discuss features or discover features that support aging in place, um, what challenges they've overcome, um, and uh, current efforts um, in ADUs. Right. Uh, and of course, we would like to uh, give recognition to AIA's uh, top level sponsors. Um, you can see the, the list here. That's it. Okay, to our panelists. Panelists for today uh, Manny Hernandez, Christina Gallo, Catherine Darnstead. Um, and uh, they'll give a brief introduction of themselves as they start to um, speak about their projects. Um, but I wanted to quickly just identify why there is a need. Why, why do accessory dwelling units and older adults uh, make a, uh, a positive impact or what, what can they benefit from? Um, and so setting up the why is uh, the, the reason we need more accessory dwelling units is because the the baby boomer generation is getting to an age where they need uh, alternatives for their housing environment. And so um, some of these statistics might seem sobering or exciting, or um, but hopefully they, they kind of resonate uh, with what you're hearing uh, and what you feel about housing for older adults and how um, we can address um, the need for, for housing typologies that benefit older adults. Um, and it should, this, I, I like to include this stat whenever I talk about older adults and their housing, um, it shouldn't really be surprising, right? Most people want to, to stay where they are, whether they feel like they're stuck or they feel like they're really enrooted in their community. They feel like their environment is a sense of their um, uh, identity. And so they want to continue to have and hold that identity. Um, and then underscoring, so we've identified, you know, underscoring what older adults need and how there are, there are more older adults that will need housing. And then underscoring the, the issue that we have a housing shortage, right? Nationally, we have it and locally as well. Um, so a couple of statistics um, on, on what, what we're seeing around the nation and within Chicago itself. So what can what are the benefits of ADUs for older adults? Well, they simply can allow older adults to age in place, um, which help promote autonomy. People can uh, feel like they control their environment if they are choosing to live in or they have an option to, to live in a, a new space. Um, it can also lengthen the amount of time that they spend in their community. Instead of relocating to a different community, they might choose to move to a, a, the accessory dwelling unit on their property or move in with um, an adult child uh, within their neighborhood. Um, it can help in, help to strengthen intergenerational relationships in, within the family and in the community um, and provide flexibility and physical environment. And I think that you'll see that um, ring true in the case studies that we're gonna talk about that people are able to um, adapt, have, have their housing environment adapt to uh, their needs. Uh, it could also provide fe uh, financial flexibility to allow older adults to um, 
have their housing environment um, um, be financially stable while their income might be stagnant or um, and their medical costs are rising, uh, financial flexibility in the house environment can help balance um, uh, their financial accounts. And then um, it can provide supportive care during late life transitions that um, whether it is medical care or um, social or uh, relationship, um, they can restore those relationships during these late life transitions. So a couple of um, notes about what an accessory dwelling unit is. And so they, it takes, takes many shapes and forms, um, but essentially it is a, a, a dwelling unit that is an accessory to a primary dwelling unit. And so um, this diagram created by Booth Hansen in the ULI Chicago uh, brochure about dwelling accessory dwelling units identify different types uh, that could be common in, in Chicago. And so there are detached and attached units. There are single or multi story options. Um, and there are also ADU options within the primary structure. So a basement conversion or an attic conversion uh, would be considered an accessory dwelling unit. And so we thought it'd be good to include um, some of the data on ADUs because um, historically ADUs have not been uh, permitted in Chicago and recently they have uh, been allowed. And so um, Chicago's cityscape monitors the permits issued for ADUs. And so they have this information available uh, to its uh, to its members. And so I think what's telling about this is, you know, how many are using um, backyard house permits and how few are converting um, attic units. And so um, some kind of um, telling trends in, in how people are using the new ADU ordinance. And then uh, just a note on how long it, it takes to get a permit um, for an ADU. It takes about 120 days. Um, and then I think this is my um, second, this is my last slide before handing it over to the panelists. But um, Chicago Cityscape also provides data on potential units for ADUs. So they have um, analyzed the zones where their uh, properties are eligible um, and they have quantified um, where their, what areas are capable of, of filing for an ADU. So I hope that sets up um, a good background and in information for uh, the panelists. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Manny Hernandez first, and then we'll hear from Christina and Catherine following. Thank you very much, Drew. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel. Um, uh, you'll, you'll, have a lot, you'll hear a lot of great things uh, from everyone and on here. I think it was really great. Uh, what's put together here, I think, to be able to share. Uh, for those of you uh, that don't know me, our, our background is both uh, as architect and general contractor, so we are design build. Um, so, uh, we've been doing it for uh, at least the last 10 years. And so uh, what I appreciate about being able to share with you uh, is the, the relevance of what we've seen over the years, uh, uh, increased requests for uh, that in-law suite kind of preparation, um, aging in place considerations that we're getting a lot of requests uh, to address these conditions uh, from our clients. All our work is directly for the end user. Um, so it's been interesting really to see how it all has started to accumulate and become a much bigger conversation with the uh, ADUs being allowed, how that's kind of morphed into a much bigger planning process for the clients. So what I, what I wanted to share with you today, um, and, and Drew, you can go ahead, next slide, is, is really um, two, different, um, two different typographies that I think is, is obviously very relevant in Chicago and um, 
these are, we have a two flat that we are the architecture of record on uh, working with. And on the right side is a fairly standard Chicago bungalow, uh, typical lot size. Um, uh, and although very different clients, we find that the requests and, and the planning uh, and really what the what the design and the architecture has been revolving around is really this longer term uh, aging in place, um, multi-generational uh, housing um, checks off all the points of, of what Drew was was kind of really trying to envelop everything into is really what has, has accumulated. And what I wanted to share with you is a little bit about the projects themselves specifically of, of how uh, they're being both addressed in, in, in these, but also kind of the commonalities that we've been using that transcends between existing housing that obviously uh, lends itself into how it gets integrated in the approach to ADUs. Uh, so a little bit of specifically about the uh, client requests for these uh, for this home on a two flat, which obviously is already set up as two separate living quarters, um, which lends itself to obviously a, a, a out of the box kind of conditions that lend themselves really well. Um, a client is looking for multi generational. Uh, they obviously want to have more space, um, and so instead of converting it to a single family residence, uh, they've opted to duplex down. Uh, this property specifically is closer to the ground level as far as access and stairs. So getting into that floor is less complicated, um, but obviously uh, how, how much square footage and how much space and existing building. So it is being fully renovated on the interior to address access and doorways and, and things of those conditions. Uh, they are increasing square footage. Actually, if we can say back on that one, Drew, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the nod. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is specifically to their approach is they're going to duplex down. Uh, so there is the, we are designing for an elevator in the unit to be able to connect the two floors. Uh, the, the kids, which are, they're looking for that, this house for them is uh, something they intend to pass down generationally. Uh, we'll be living on the second floor. So that way they have family in space. And in the reason that the, uh, I wrote one, two, or three as far as multi generational is because commonly has been uh, consistently coming up is really not just parent and who takes care of them, but we find that now the parents are really looking at how they uh, take care of their parents um, in the housing. So, really, you know, we're starting to, uh, and it's again, it's become consistent, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to really bring it up is because we're really looking at, you know, ground floor, secondary, uh, primary suites. So that way they can have mom or dad uh, stay with them and while they're on the other floor and then still have that third generation above. So we're really trying to starting to bridge a lot of gaps between housing and really what that means as far as generational and assistance as everyone starts to look forward to that aging in place um, and longevity of staying in their home longer. Um, and you'll see that throughout the projects, we have similar conditions that, you know, we'll just touch on, uh, but I think, you know, it's, it's obviously pretty relevantly known already through um, making things accessible, long, larger, larger corridors, bigger doorways, um, things that really make the interior mobility. Uh, what I wanted to point out is just some things that maybe aren't always as common, but things that as architects, we can definitely include at the beginning for example, the elevator is going to be a shaft that will be a closet for both floors today, but has all the infrastructure so that way the cost to implement it one day um, is, is much smaller to absorb and much more easily to implement. Um, go ahead, Drew. And on the bungalow, uh, you know, very similar intentions. Uh, two generations, we're adding a second story uh, that I think I have some, some reference photos of it. This is the photo of the original house. Um, biggest uh, thing I think that comes up consistently uh, is how you get to that first floor, right? Everyone knows you have 10 stairs up and as a retrofit, um, there's a lot of elevators, you know, exterior elevator lifts to be able to, you know, access it. Owners really wanted us to see if we can come up with a much more architecturally integrated approach, uh, which you'll see in a minute. And, you know, again, just looking at 
trying to make the exterior connections and all the connections really larger and more accessible. Um, not, neither one of these, uh, actually the first project uh, is doing, uh, has the plans to be able to do, uh, we are planning for a coach house uh, as, a, as a future phase. Uh, this owner on here decided not to, and really the, the in-law suite configuration is what's gonna happen on the bungalow. Go ahead. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, you can see what we, what we did, which uh, for us was a unique condition that really we, uh, we felt really worked well with the lot is that we actually integrated uh, really a ramp connection that goes all the way from the garage up to the back of the house. Uh, they really wanted to have something that was connected in with the landscape. Um, this was a little fussy to get uh, approved through zoning since it's it's not really a standard condition and I'm sure everyone's going to talk about how you know some of these new things be ADU and how we address them architecturally to even like this ramp because he's not a typical answer um, uh, we were able to work with them to really map out how the code uh, at least we felt the code allows us to do this without any special permissions um, and we were able to get it approved. Uh, and you can see, obviously, it's it's still a work in progress, but the ramp itself is built. It's connected with the with the fence as an integrated piece. Um, and on the right, you can obviously see the elevator, which is part of the two flat unit. So what we're trying to incorporate with all of these is really uh, addressing accessibility um, in a much, I guess, broader. Um, approach and you know who doesn't like a ramp right between the dogs coming through between a, a functioning adult having an injury that he's got a cast on you know we find that a lot of these answers are really becoming I think in my perspective much bigger universal answers uh, which really isn't meant to address one particular um, condition but really just may, really I think starts to build upon what what accessible housing starts to look like. And within those, some of the things I really wanted to focus on is really point out uh, some of the things that we've been doing throughout the years, but also, um, but also more specifically, I think I just wanted to point attention to uh, on the left side, you could see some of the yes and large doorways that we're doing um, into the rooms, but you'll see what the, the left top photo is in construction. The bottom one is really what the finished version is going to be is trying to answer it in a way that still allows for an architectural uh, space to feel really good and not have doorways necessarily feel like they're off of living spaces when we don't want them to. Um, uh, zero threshold showers. Uh, so we're obviously doing some of these doors where they're larger and sliding and double doors where they're a little bit um, different of an approach for some of these doorways to really make it the wet room. The bathrooms are, are becoming 100% wet room floors. So they're being waterproof completely. So we're just treating the whole room like a big shower. And the right side, we have some of our, what I call smart locks, but they're, uh, I, I feel like they're, they're dummy proof answers because they're all mechanical, there's no batteries. So, you know, there's a components that over the years we've been building upon um, that allow us to be able to come with a really low tech answer. Let's go to the next one. My last slide, and then we'll, I'll happily turn it over. You know, and in, in what we're looking at is obviously building in things that address energy and efficiency. And, and that is really coming from the client as they are trying to come up with things that make it less, uh, uh, although I, this could be debated, but uh, answers that are less technical, uh, easier to maintain are becoming more mainstream, but over a period of time really uh, eases their functionality and, and, and allows things to happen more uh, automated. So we're using uh, censored, um, hot water recirculation lines. So they're, they're on sensors. They don't have to push a button. It's not running when no one's home. Uh, heat pumps, which really reduces their energy consumption. Uh, project has a lot of solar panels on it. And then we're, you know, things like even the exhaust fans as we're going through are all being automated with sensors, humidistats, things that allow them to operate without that person using them. And so uh, just the, the last closing thing I just wanted to say is really we've been looking for integrating approaches that are really making the, my mom would suffer 
as this thermostat, she can't understand how to make it move temperature, it auto resets, right? So we, we've been looking at finding ways that really use technology or, or functionality in a way that makes the end user as they get older, less techy sometimes, um, to really be able to live in the home with, uh, and function without having to um, really worry about how it works uh, in a good way. So we're automating things in a clean way that we know from companies that are really good equipment, really quality sensors and things that we can use to ease the, ease the operation and their functionality of being able to have to use them physically. So with that, um, I'll happily turn it over. Thanks, Benny. If you could go back one slide, Drew, on that one. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, and Christina and myself will introduce ourselves in the next slide. But what I want to share is a little bit of how this format will work. Uh, Via and Layton, we, we're two uh, firms here in Chicago um, who know each other, who have very similar projects. And we have two ADUs that kind of grew up together um, in the after the ADU pilot program was passed. And so how we want to present those today is kind of in a pair. Um, we call it a, a Chicago love story to understand how coach houses and our perspective, uh, respective designs came to be through the various zoning site client challenges, because we have a lot of similarities, mm -hmm. but it, it the design evolved through these um, changes within the ADU ordinances and the way that we've interpreted them. So if you go to the next slide, um, I'll hand it to Christina to introduce herself. Um, I'm Catherine with Layton and Christina. Hey everyone, I'm Christina Gallo with Via Chicago. Um, as Catherine said, we have these two very similar projects that uh, really relate to one another. We're excited to be, to have tested the pilot project firsthand and really advocated for our clients. Um, throughout this process, so we'll go to our next slide, um, introduce our clients and the project and and how um, this journey was really uh, a response to who we were designing for. Um, so with the coach house that I designed, it's in the Wicker Park um, pilot area. And our client, Beth, um, is a mother-in-law, a recently turned grandma. Um, she had her granddaughter, Rosie, was born the day that she moved into her coach house, which is quite incredible, uh, beautiful timing. Um, but she is um, someone who works from home, loves running, and really loves um, spending time with her dog, Argus, and was looking for a way to, to really support her son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter in co-living together, uh, be there to see her granddaughter grow up. For our client, this is how we realized our similarities start even with the client. You know, we have a mother-in-law and we both, uh, both of our clients have very generous son-in-laws who kind of look at creating this space for a mother-in-law um, who, uh, for ours, for Brian and Fiona, built it for their mother-in-law. Um, and as during the process of the project, we renovated their three-flat building and then also added the coach house. Uh, they got married, got pregnant, and so the deadline was very strict <laughs> in terms of when this had to get done um, by November 1 to allow for both baby and holidays to happen in, um, in the coach house and with the two families. If you go to the next slide. So we have varying existing conditions, which really is going to set the theme to the design outcome. Um, we were working with an RT4 a uh, lot within Wicker Park, actually a row house condition, which is quite unique to Chicago, not very common. Um, in the rear of the lot, there was an existing CMU two-car garage um, that had a much larger footprint than the coach house allowed. For a split second, we thought, great, because there's an existing garage, maybe we can build beyond the allowable zoning footprint and use that as precedent. Um, submitted a letter to zoning and our hearts were broken. No, you must uh, stay within the pilot uh, project rules. We'll uh, talk a little bit more about that uh, in a second. And for ours, we're in the North uh, ADU pilot area. Um, it will, if you go back one, um, one more, there you go, perfect. Um, it is also an RT4 lot, but we have a three flat as the primary residence. And then we have an existing two car garage, which you could see had a ghosted second story at some point in time, which had come down. So maybe we had a ghosted coach house. Um, within that, we have a, uh, we had to keep and maintain the two car existing garage. 
uh, or it's two car parking spots when we were designing the space. And if you go to the next slide, you can start to see how the site um, and the lot size and lot type started to manifest itself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So because the principal home in our artsy for a lot was a single family home, we only needed to comply with one parking spot. So this is the unique condition. Um, one of the um, um, things that set the tone for how the massing of the coach house was going to result is that we were working with an almost typical Chicago lot. It's 25 by 124, just shy of 125. Um, when you calculate your allowable footprint, so what what the footprint of the coach house can take over the lot, um, we arrived at 520 square feet. That was our max allowable footprint, even though your coach house can be 700 square feet, which is a much more appropriate size for a single for a one single person to live in. Um, 520 square feet is a challenge. Um, we'll continue to see uh, how this um, shapes up. And then for ours, we were a little bit wider of a lot, 28 feet. So it allowed us to, you know, not have to encroach to maintain that side yard and pathway all the way through the lot. We have loads of space because we're 151 feet deep. So we didn't even really have to worry about maintaining rear yard and the setbacks because we had just lots of space. Within that, then we were able to max out the ADU footprint at 700 square feet. And because we were an early permit under the pilot program, you know, now you they are the city and department of buildings isn't counting some of the same spaces within an ADU towards your ADU footprint, meaning under the stair, mechanical or other like little, little things within that, because we were fighting for every inch and they were really looking and measuring our drawings from confirming the height of 22 feet uh, to confirming, you know, that this is 700 square feet and not 707, which we originally submitted it at and hope no one would notice, but they did. Next slide. Yep. I dare to say that the <laughs> 500-ish square feet is very responsive to the type of square footage that a two-car garage typically takes today. Um, because most garages in Chicago are built without foundations, those typically have to be uh, uh, demoed and then a new structure with true foundations has to get built. Um, that resulted for us in a footprint of about um, 25 by 20. Uh, again, very responsive to car space and not human living. Um, so something that I think we can do better, especially when thinking about aging in place is not giving the same amount of space um, as you do for two car storage for one person living. Just start to rethink rethink about how you prioritize uh, living within these multi-generational spaces. Um, in our condition, we had 30, a 30-foot 30 separation between the main house and the coach house, and that's really where the family converges and comes together and uses this as that co-living um, space. As our client's granddaughter grows up and their family grows, this is very much that, that key moment uh, within the site plan. And then for ours, you can see we have that 50-foot separation with the extra deep lot between uh, the coach house and the primary residence. We fit a two-car, um, All this is all electric in terms of our ADU, our primary, the primary residence we work to convert that to all electric. And this was kind of fitting within the client's ethos of energy efficiency that they wanted to kind of push within their project. Um, and then we, if you go to the next slide, you can start to see how that footprint and that extra space between the two layouts start to manifest itself. Tina? Mm -hmm. Because our footprint was tied to the that 520 square foot max, what one of the earlier choices that we made, um, us, our client, uh, interior designer, uh, and Rezac was that rather than having wall thicknesses, we were going to absorb spatial separation, storage, um, and defining of rooms through cabinetry instead of walls. Um, cabinetry is a half an inch, three quarters of an inch thick. A wall is five inches thick at its thinnest. Uh, so even those couple of, of inches being lost, um, being regained uh, within this open floor plan was incredibly helpful towards uh, this uh, layout. This is mm -hmm. very much meant to be lived by one person, not multiple people. Um, I think that's how you take advantage of that open floor plan. Mm -hmm. And for us, the, we, our client very much wanted rooms and defined spaces. And with 700 square feet, we, and the footprint we had, we were able to accommodate that into a one bed, one, de one bed plus den layout with an open 
kind of kitchen living area, which ends up being roughly the same with between our two ADU layouts. Um, we had a lot of, of looking at, again, in the same way Christina and their ADU is thinking about utilizing cabinetry um, to take up space, we ended up using cabinetry, you know, to build out the washer dryer surround and some other elements. We also were fighting for inches around door swings. So we looked at pocket doors uh, throughout, which when in retrospect, when the client kind of gave some feedback after living there for about six months or so, it's like, oh, they would rather have more swing doors because it became harder for them to put up pictures. And then thinking about, you know, future tenants that go in there, you know, they love the one bed den. So that helps with a family or for multiple people, but it becomes harder to hang your stuff on the wall. Yeah. Next if, slide. When I look at our floor plan, if we just had a couple more square feet to go, then we could really think about aging in place and not needing things like a Murphy bed or an all-inclusive kitchen within a kitchen island, a lot of the ins and outs uh, that, that we were required uh, to move around, which I think we see in the next slide. Oh, so within here, um, this is a very important part of designing a coach house. It's that access and the view from the primary residence towards the coach house itself. We had that side walkway um, one of the things we did was integrate a snow melt system within the space, just anticipating the Chicago load of need needing to shovel when that's your main principal door, um, as well as an inner connection within the parking garage and that inner entry space itself. Um, Catherine? And then for ours, you could start to see this blue of the exterior um, kind of peeking through for those that were observant, you saw our renderings and massings were green. This was the fun of construction procurement is that you plan for green and you end up getting blue. Um, uh, but that peak in that primary walkway and that large, um, how we're seeing that and how does that feel special and directive and not, you know, you're really welcoming in that space. You see from the massing also, because we were, had more depth, we were able to carve away recessed entry and then balcony spaces within the overall form of the ADU. And then we have a pitched roof to optimize for future solar on uh, south facing roof. And then that was really where we were getting into the specifics of the measurement of a height of a building um, with DOB as they reviewed our drawings. Uh, next slide. So because we had um, the advantage of only needing to have one parking space, we ended up having a narrower but elongated rectangular footprint, which resulted in this key space. This key space is a six foot deep entryway that has a folding door that really connects the six feet with the extended backyard. We wanted to gain as many additional you know, square feet as possible, even if we had to blend indoors and outdoors together. Um, this mm -hmm. space, the six foot depth also um, allowed us to bend the stair above what would have been that second required parking spot, but because we weren't required, we were okay with lowering the headroom and stealing away from the parking area to have um, an accessible, uh, just a, a more comfortable stair coming up. Uh, really right. trying to ditch the winders. Yeah, and we do have winders and we that came from they didn't our client didn't want to reduce the head height in the garage because they have SUVs or a minivan, right? So they have taller cars. Um, the other piece is because we had the wider lot, we could we could put the stairs off to one side. So we put it on the north edge of the pro of the building, which is right on the property line. So it's a two hour wall. And that still allowed us enough space to fit a traditional two car garage. We integrated storage in the stair, all these little pieces to try and build more storage, uh, but that came a little bit late in the project. Um, you know, we had it, it got VE'd out because it was a cost, but then it came back as we found other savings. And I think while storage in stairs is really nice, um, it's very bad for storing like larger shoes. So if you maybe have a men's <laughs> size shoe or a gym shoe or a winter boot, um, it doesn't really work as well when you when you do it after the fact. Um, but they're very nice for um, other things or nice uh, flats to put in there. Uh, next slide. 
<laughs> all right, so within our living area, it really all revolves around the smart cabinetry. So replacing walls with smart cabinetry and allowing spaces to be as flexible as possible. We fit the entire kitchen within the island and the two doors that you see opening up. Um, and somehow later on, once Beth was already moving there, we opened up a couple of doors and she has additional storage space, which we were pleasantly surprised by. And for ours, our client had a strong desire for traditionally sized appliances. So as we were, many of us probably think within ADUs and smaller spaces, let's utilize, you know, a 24 inch cabinetry module within that. But for this, the client really wanted the 30 inch refrigerator, the 30 inch, um, you know, range. And then we also started to make a cohesive living area through the use of tiled surfaces and additional cabinetry to disguise both storage, HVAC, and then also washer dryer. In this space, uh, we have a ribbon window above um, with the additional height in the living area. We have that ribbon window above the um, upper cabinets and then additional skylights. Um, so we get lots of natural light, but we don't have views to the alley um, that we have to worry about because in this, in this alley, there are a lot of roof deck garages, garage roof decks, um, things going on, you know, gonzo, gonzo decks um, and lots of backyard views that you could see into the space. So we started to think about bringing light but not views into the building. Next slide. So right there, one before. Um, one of the challenges we had with designing this very open floor plan was that our client works from home. Um, so she needed to have flexibility between having her bedroom be a bedroom only at nighttime and then mm -hmm. having her office feel like an office space throughout the day. Um, so this, uh, we worked with our interior designer to come up with a Murphy bed system that worked really well within these back cabinets and then a folding desk uh, that allows um, our client to really set up shop uh, during the day and then hide it all away for relaxing evenings. And for our client, the den in the space became art work space um, to be able to close off and have a separate room. Um, and then we really thought through how are we framing views to the shared backyard? Um, again, because we're right next to other garage roof decks and other views adjacent um, within the space. And we were trying through all of the um, ability to carve away those voids to be able to craft, you know, a little bit larger closet space or a walk-in somewhere within the footprint, the layout. Next slide. We very much wanted to have outdoor air and maximize as much daylight and fresh air as possible. So we had a three-sided integrated cantilevered balcony towards the front um, to really make up for the fact that many times the coach house is best if it sits right against the property light which means that an entire facade is gonna be blank, no opportunity for natural daylight and fresh air. So this seemed like a really important piece to integrate within the design. And agreed with Christina. I mean, our ADU is up, justified up against the interior lot line. And then we were able to carve away space uh, for this balcony. Uh, this, um, again, to remind people, we were early in the ADU pilot program of when this coach house went in for permit. And due to this particular balcony, this extended the permit review timeline to eight months, which was which the construction was only six and a half, seven months. So it took longer to permit than it did to build um, overall. And this is where the interpretation of the ADU ordinance and specifically decks kind of and, and balconies versus decks came into play. So when we presented the design, um, zoning came back and said, nope, this is, um, you can't have this balcony, only three sided, op three open sided balconies are allowed in the rear yard setback, which is part of a definition for the primary residence, not the ADU, but that's how they interpreted it. So they asked us to get a, the client to get an administrative adjustment. They fully went through the administrative adjustment process, submitted it, zoning came back and said, well, no, we really want you to get a variance. Um, instead of an administrative adjustment, which they had just completed uh, the full process for, um, asked for a variance. Um, this was about in November, December of 2022. Uh, um, I may have lost a little bit of my mind and sent a, a strongly worded email 
uh, to some folks. And then for Christmas, we get a permit. And so we got a permit through the interpretation that this is a roof deck, which is allowed in the rear yard setback. It is not a balcony. It is a roof deck um, that has since kind of changed and, and interpretations and conditions have aligned. Um, so I think this becomes, hopefully it became easier for other people as they move through the process. Uh, next slide. And then I think we have a long ways to go with alley conditions and how mm -hmm. we really envision uh, coach houses to take a presence and improve the the perception and the feeling of the alley. Hopefully the pilot, um, hopefully the ADU ordinance continues to evolve to allow a little bit more flexibility in other areas in order for us to really solve things like um, AC condensers, um, which should not be located towards the rear yard, uh, that has to get, you know, relocated towards the side, um, really solve for proper roof drainage, mm -hmm. as well as just the feeling of that alley itself. Yeah, agreed with Christina. And what we also saw is, you know, the reality of how are we keeping the uh, alley facade from just getting beat up, um, you know, so, you know, keep Sometimes bollards are just the right choice uh, for garbage for your own for your own entryway, and then thinking about how um, that becomes maintained and viewed uh, long term. Next slide. And of course, that in between space has become critical as we've worked through many, many designs for other coach houses. Um, with with this space, our client worked with the outside studio landscaping company to solve initially what was drainage issues that we were having, where the the lot terrain was pushing the water towards the principal home. So we wanted to go ahead and resolve that while the work was happening. But of course, to make that a beautiful space where both main home and coach house come connect a very neutral zone all are welcome that space where family can really share meals kids running around barbecues um that's one of the thoughts that we're most most pleased with and for our client um they love the outdoor space but that wasn't part of their initial budget because they are in a fully shaded lot that is uh, from the two adjacent properties. Uh, so we have AstroTurf uh, for the moment uh, until they raise the funds to properly update their backyard. Uh, next slide. And this was a, a fantastic um, coincidence. Uh, we were both uh, featured in Dwell just one week after another, pretty much, where very different stories were told uh, in in terms of the design and what coach houses do um, did for our clients and for setting an example in Chicago. Um, with us, it was all about multi generational living and our client really pulling resources with her son to help purchase this property and and you know invest in the future of her son's uh, life in her granddaughter's life uh, in being able to co live and you know grow old together. Mm -hmm. And for us within our dwell article and discussion, it was, is our coach houses part of an affordability solution within Chicago? And ADUs might be, but a, as you saw from the data of basement conversions uh, in terms of the quantity of ADUs and then a very different price point for that, um, but maybe the standalone coach house um, becomes a price point that isn't, doesn't make it affordable, but it's all part of you know, a larger discussion around aging place, thinking about sustainability and the potential of seeing, you know, the pilot program, but how can we continue to improve if the goal is affordability within Chicago through ADUs, you know, we have to potentially think about other solutions as we push and evolve this forward. Yeah, so what, what do we really want to see within these 12 articles? Just an interpretation of how, um, Coach houses allow for aging in place. You're going to see that in our conditions, um, they're still very tough. A lot of that space was prioritized to parking and not people. Um, you're still required steep stairs to arrive up. In our case, very tight conditions, which made it really difficult to circulate or to even adapt towards a more accessible um, maneuvering, let's say, um, as our client um, you know, wants to be here for many decades to come. Um, so we hope that the next iterations, as we get to to submit our input uh, to how the ordinance is written, really opens up for true aging in place.
And we'll hand it back to you, Drew and Heidi, for the resources. Thanks. Um, so we wanted to include a couple of um, links and um, information so that people can uh, um, look up some of these uh, these publications to say what uh, what is an ADU, how can they do that in Chicago, um, and how can they do that um, sustainably. So um, we'll provide the um, presentation to be available, uh, and hopefully, hopefully people will find it useful. Thanks so much to all of you. This was uh, really great. I want to open up for questions. We've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, and this would be a great time if other people have other questions to start populating. Um, before we go there, though, I just we really want to thank all three of you for sharing your projects and such an interesting and just kind of diverse look at, you know, what what is an ADU or what is a multi-generational living situation in the city. And I think you know, we can see just from these three different project types, lots of potential, but also many challenges or potential room for improvement. I mean, I think one thing that really strikes me is, you know, the difference between Manny's projects where we're not bound necessarily by these very tiny unit sizes. He's able to do, you know, to provide provisions for a future elevator to really greatly increase accessibility. Whereas the two of you with your standalone ADUs, it's not really even a possibility without taking away critical living space, right? From the dwelling units themselves. So I'm curious, um, just to kind of kick off, you know, now that you've been through these two projects and with the lens of, of, aging in place and the goals of your clients, like what suggestions would you make to make it more aging friendly or more supportive of, you know, of your client's long-term ability to remain in these homes? And how could the, the ordinance be improved? I think there should be a, a way where the parking should be sacrificed. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the route is for this and how to get consensus um, and support from from whether it's your neighbor's neighborhood, alderman, uh, whatever way that really makes it um, fair and equitable. But if the parking were to be eliminated for a family that is not looking for and will not be making use of that space, um, then this really would allow for coach houses uh, to work more like they do in LA, um, in Nashville, I mean, everywhere across the US where that ground floor living is key. Yeah. That actually is a good segue into the very first question about um, do you guys see a, a need or a possibility here in Chicago for a program similar to LA's program that has approved standard plans? Uh, what might like that look like or what could that mean for our ADU uh, landscape here in Chicago? That's a great question. And I I we I just was on a call with the new ADA, ADU liaison in Department of Housing earlier this week. Um, and part of that is that's a continued recommendation. So I think many designers and contractors keep promoting it. Um, I think where um, it's a desire, you know, will this particular administration embrace that as a pathway forward for ADU, specifically coach houses? Um, there is, uh, because the reality is coach houses, even with pre-approved plans, they're still incredibly expensive as a price point. Um, National Housing Serv uh, Neighborhood Housing Services, NHS, already has a better basement um, handbook that outlines um, converting basement and garden unit dwelling units and typical layouts as part of that. So there is um, a kind of a pre-approved standard that's geared towards homeowners for that through the N NHS Better Basements program, which is in one of the resources links. Um, you know, I think there is a desire like the coach house tends to be the sexy one, right? You know, because it's a standalone building, there's a lot of design options with it. There's different places it could go. But what really what you see in L.A., um, I think, Christina, you mentioned Nashville, Seattle and Portland is that they don't have ground floor parking requirements. And then that is starting to be what brings the affordability metric lower um, for the construction and then makes it ADUs possible. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point, Catherine. And just to touch on what Catherine just mentioned is that also too, most of those regions are, uh, don't have frost depths like we do in Chicago. So that's a big, uh, you know, we see what we're seeing in a lot of these presentations, obviously, and in the coach house, and we've had these conversations internally too, through, you know, th through AIA is that, you know, what we see is everything above ground, but obviously like that's one of the issues with the garages not working that they move too much because we have frost depth, you know, in the Midwest. And so that means that really the garage 
becomes a mini house and with that comes all the infrastructure that it needs to be a mini house and so that's where you know that's always going to be you know a struggle we're going to face so you know we'll never be able to compete with the same price levels that you know the warmer climates obviously can build for versus what we'll have to do here in the midwest so that's always going to be a contention to that we just have to work around and I think the utility aspect is huge um, and the difference between a basement uh, garden unit ADU conversion versus a standalone coach house um, is the level of disruption that happens within that primary residence. Uh, the primary residence on the property is huge, right? We have to bring a new service from the front to the rear, right? Unless you're on a corner and you maybe have two service um, lines, but you're coming all the way through that primary unit. You, you know, you have a rat's nest usually in the alley of electrical that you have to re coordinate. So there's a lot happening from the utility aspect and that alone, you know, for our ADU, we were able to time it and just the the extended permit permitting helped with the timeline where the where the current garden unit tenant was going to move out. Um, and then they just didn't re-rent that until that work was done. So it there was no very little disruption to the primary residence, which the owner lived in, and then they were also gone for a part of it. So we had kind of a, a, a an open building to work with. Christina, I know you had different challenges. <laughs> Absolutely. We're really bringing in the water was one of the toughest uh, things. There was disruption to the main principal home, um, as is then getting enough distance to bring sewer out. Um, many times you're required to upgrade electrical. Um, the choice to be an all electric is very much um, the right choice to make for these buildings. Um, we shouldn't be bringing gas lines all the way to the back of the lot just for a dryer and maybe a, a cooktop. Um, this is a great uh, opportunity to take advantage of all the incentive programs. And I think I'm jumping a little ahead, but why not to take uh, to take advantage of all the incentives to have these prepped for solar. Um, Comet has great incentives, go to the state of Illinois to to really have these you know ready and prepped for solar power uh, to make up for what is almost always the need to upgrade your electrical service to 400 amp, if not more. Somebody else asked about other challenges for utility tie-ins, you know, more related to water service or sewer tie-ins. Can you guys talk about that at all? We had the tiniest little detail, but just bringing in our water. Um, we have that six foot deep entry space. Um, that's a two hour wall and we required a foundation right there, separating that entry space in the garage. Um, we ended up with our water service in an incredibly inconvenient space um, hidden within those cabinets um because we couldn't you know go double under both both continuous footings um that was a little coordination detail so this is all to say that even though the footprint is small the headaches are the same and the complexities of building a coach house versus a principal home are essentially the same did you bring in uh, for both of you was it a separate water service for the the adu it wasn't tied off of the main house or is this tied off and is yours separate Christina? Ours is separate. Okay. Well, it ties through and then it extends to the coach house. Got it. But you didn't bring in a new water service just for the ADU? Not a new one, but we were required to upgrade the existing Correct. service. Yeah. And we, because we were renovating the main oh, unit in the main building and at the coach house, we upgraded the service as part of the apartment, the apartment renovation. So we upgraded that first. And then because we had to for that renovation too. So there were some costs of scale that were able to be absorbed essentially between two projects on the same lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Hey, Manny, in your project, was the basement already set up as a separate dwelling unit or did you have to go through some hurdles to kind of actually separate it out or you know, does it function as a fully separate apartment? And there, there actually was a question to a follow-up for you about, you know, a future ADU, a standalone ADU and how does that work with having a basement unit? If you want to address that a little bit as well. Sure. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit on the uh, utilities. Uh, I think in general, there's there's always exceptions to the rules, but in general, uh, water is tied off the, the principal building. So is their sewer line. Uh, electricity is always, uh, for the most part, going to be its new service. And this is specifically as we're talking about uh, coach houses. Electricity becomes its own. Gas, we've had on the construction side, we've had extensive conversations with the Department of Gas uh, uh, people's gas and, and talking to them on the new construction services. And so there are exceptions. Uh, it really depends on what's, what's being provided in the street, uh, how clean of a path can they actually get to the building? So they're open to it. 
Um, so just know that there, there is possibility of actually bringing in gas directly, but it really is on a specific case. And since most of all these cases, there is already a principal building to work around. That really is part of the complexity of saying, can they physically even get it there? So that's where uh, really for simplicity, most of them are always gonna be electric and there is ways of extending it from the principal structure. But again, those become, you know, again, probably more case by case basis. Um, so as far as our, the, the, the bungalow, uh, that was, it was interesting because that one, um, although they could have, that one, they're not doing any separate ADU. They're not doing it uh, in the house. They're not doing it as a, as a coach house. Uh, the garage was rebuilt in a way. So it's, it's carrying most of the solar panels. Um, and the, it's kind of a, uh, you know, the difference between finishing out your basement and what is in the city's eyes a legal ADU, I mean, uh, an in-law suite really is a, a semantic of cooking equipment being allowed. And so the rest of it is in there. So what the family opted to do is because they really think of that person eventually living there as being integrated as part of the house, we did not include additional provisions. There is a wet bar, has sink, has refrigerators, but they're assuming that person's gonna come up and eat with them as part of the family. Um, that could easily be converted into an in-law suite. Um, you know, we have, it's, everything was designed to clean access and we have upgraded electricity. So we have ways of bringing it in and we do have provisions for like their separate uh, electric single unit washer dryer in that wet bar area. So they have all the infrastructure to do so. Um, for the two flat, that one, uh, that one is already a two flat. So that one really, we're only adding one. And so uh, I think to answer that question more specifically, you're allowed only one ADU per unit. So for per property, so it doesn't matter if it's in the principal structure or detached, but you're really allowed only one additional unit. So, you know, it really depends on how, you know, what the approach is. That makes sense. Thank you. I think we've made it through the Q and A questions. If anybody out there has any additional questions, I'd love to see them. Otherwise, um, Drew, do you have any questions for the group? Certainly back no, to our I, intro. No, I think all the questions I had um, were either really super technical questions or um, have been answered. So I think that this, the notes about utilities, sustainability and aging in place were all great topics to have covered. Um, so I think that that's a great position to close on. Yeah. And don't know if, if someone wants to touch on it, but I saw, I think someone posted, and this is to Christina and to Catherine, because I think uh, you guys may have it, uh, is uh, an idea on the cost, because I, I know everyone always wants to know what it costs, and I think both of you guys may have had some some feedback on what it costs oh, wow. to build it. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, I'll, I could start, and I'll hand it to you, Christina. So our, I we did answer it in the chat, too. Um, so our development budget, you know, all in was for the coach house to start was 300000 so that's design, permit, construction fees, all in. Um, uh, and then we ended at just under 350. Um, there were owner requested changes. There was the additional fun of going through zoning processes and then um, with those delays, uh, changed some material pricing. Because um, as I mentioned, it was eight months of permitting and seven months of construction. And we went from one calendar year to another in that process. And so we did have some price changes. Uh, Christina? Yeah, our site conditions required a lot of utility upgrades, demoing the existing garage. Um, all of that came at about four hundred and fifty thousand for the base building costs, and then there were multiple owner upgrades added uh, on top of that, which added up to about one hundred and fifty um, extra. This had to do with just the choosing of the windows, the siding, uh, the interior finishes, appliances. So it's a really large investment. It's not a solution uh, for you know affordable housing uh, per se. We want to find ways in which we can cut some of these costs and be more creative. We did go through a pricing exercise for um, another similar coach house that used uh, Wally walls, panelized wall systems, um, and still ended up at about, you know, north of 350, right about $400 a square foot. Um, so still looking to see if any construction systems give us an edge towards uh, making uh, these more affordable. Yeah, and we looked at um, SIPs panels for this construction before, and that came north of half a million, right, mm -hmm. from some of the suppliers um, that were providing and including some other, you know, ADU um, specific builders that um, promote this type of uh, SIP construction that exists within the Chicagoland area. 
So we went with, you know, uh, your traditional wood framing um, throughout the building and that was able to bring the cost down. But, you know, our Delta when we went out for initial bid was, you know, over 150,000 for the design that you see. So there was still a lot of price inflation, um, a lot of because it's just seen as a custom bespoke element, um, there is a, a lot of additional cost that comes in there that I don't know if it's warranted. I mean, Manny, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it, it is true. And I think this is where we talk about, and I think some of the comments that they're alluding to is like, is there a way eventually, you know, some of these structures to be a little bit more standardized, you know, and I think in time, both as what, you know, Catherine, uh, mentioned a lot about, you know, being in the, in the forefront of the initial passes, there's a lot of the timing and the reviews and the new codes that get, you know, uh, kind of clarified to be able to, to me, it reminds me of the time we were doing when the coach, uh, when the roof decks started to be popular and then they put a big halt on it to really understand how it was having impacts. Right. So we're going to go through a similar, I think, process. And there are, you know, there's a lot of logistics, um, you know, especially on the construction standpoint and, you know, um, you know, utilities coming through and uh, there's an existing building on the lot. So how do they get it to excavate and sometimes those things. So you find that like in, there is a lot of logistical things that really are lot by lot specific basis as far as the way, you know, construction numbers at the end of the day get added onto you know, base standalone structure, not specifically on a lot. And what does that mean to actually implement it on a particular lot? So, um, you know, everyone kind of touched on conditions that, that affected that between utilities. Um, you know, we talked about excavation, but when you really see sometimes how do they do those things on a lot that's already built and surrounded upon and taken to the neighbor's property in consideration, shoring sometimes. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, outside conditions that affect the final cost to be able to execute that structure on a rear part of a property. So, you know, I think that's part where, you know, even as we get better in designing things that even if they got standardized, still is going to have uh, specific lot conditions that are really gonna swing, I think, price points. Yeah, I'd have to think, I mean, just given the overall small size of the, you know, what's allowed, the cost per square foot's gonna be high, right? Like if all if all of the things that have to go into this, you know, and now it's condensed into this tiny 500 to 700 square foot footprint, well, you can't spread the cost out of, you know, electrical upgrades or, you know, digging a full foundation or shoring, like you said, Manny. So it's just, it's kind of just the product of the zoning requirements of it being so small, it pushes the cost per square foot to be skyrocketing, right? So, I mean, those original stats, Drew, that you showed were, you know, I hadn't seen the one about what types of ADUs have been permitted and just doing the rough math, 70% yeah. of the current permits are for basement ADUs. Right. And it makes sense, right? Like it's easier, presumably a lot of them are already existing and are just becoming legalized or minimal work yeah. to get them there, you know, and just the huge heavy lift to get these standalone units that, you know, maybe are not the most age friendly because you can't, you know, have the elevator or just, you know, the way to vertically circuit, you can't get living space on the first floor because you need to have the garage to Christina's point. Like it's if we could drop a car, you know, we could get a prop bedroom on the first floor. That would be amazing. Yeah. Or at least a, a bathroom, right. For kind of long-term viability. So yeah, I can see a lot of potential improvements here. It's like, this is one tiny good step forward. And I think the people who you guys have designed for hopefully will have many decades worth of living with their families and, you know, meeting those goals for aging in place. But what does happen when they can't go up the stairs or they need that ground floor bedroom? Um, so I think that's something that hopefully future versions of this ordinance will take into consideration. And maybe there's some kind of trade-off system, you know, maybe it's a I don't know, like in, in the way that Chicago has in incentivized other things in the past, like maybe if we're designing for aging a place or universal design, like if you include an elevator or provisions for an elevator, you can eliminate a car space or, you know, yeah. some of these bigger picture trade-offs that would really yeah. incentivize this program to be used what it was supposed to be used for, right? To provide affordable housing, provide a way to get older adults to maybe stay in the community, but open up a larger unit for a younger family and stay connected or have income generating potential, which I mean, just the prices, you know, to build these, well, what kind of rents are you charging if it's an income producing unit, right? Like it's not going to be affordable for somebody. You'd have to charge quite a lot to recoup your investment to build it. So yeah, lots of challenges, but they're fantastic projects. And thank you so much for sharing them. I look forward to seeing the next generation of, of ADUs as hopefully some of these things get worked out and 
it's people like you, you know, pioneering through it that are going to at least show kind of the the pitfalls and potentials, I think. So, yeah. And if I can just say one last thing, uh, at least on my end, I, one, I think that just kind of connects a lot of these dots uh, that we've been seeing is that, you know, as we talk about, I think two different things, one between affordability and one about aging in place and how these ADUs and in-law suites really start to fit in the mix is that, you know, what the ADU and the coach house specifically allows now and, and is what we're seeing is that, you know, I think a lot of people are starting to plan provisions for that aging in place, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that part. And so I think in time, we're going to still we're gonna start seeing more of these ADUs. But yeah. I think that even the requests we've been working with, with our clients is less about, um, you know, which, which still equals housing and thinks about like affordability, but it's less about, sometimes it's less about affordability as far as a rental unit, but more about affordability as far as what does that aging in place and uh, in-home care versus going where do you get taken care of in, when you're, you know, in, in those last stages of life, you know? And so there's a much bigger, to be honest, broader conversation being had, I think with specifically with, with individuals and their families about, you know, what does that look like? And coach houses start to really start to play a role in that conversation, because now when you think about affordability, instead of, you know, your son or those people trying to buy a house next door in that neighborhood, right. at that point, like now for 300, you know, 350, 400,000 to build and live in the same lot and be a walking distance and having someone to help you take care of your kids and grow. Like, I think that's where like in, in that part, affordability is a very different conversation. And, and those structures now really begin to make sense when you think about those opportunities. And so, you know, I just wanted to tie in the experiences we've had with where, you know, kind of different perspective on where that affordability and living in place starts to play a role with the ADUs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's I think a, your family's story, you know, kind of embodies what, you know, Manny was talking about is, you know, not necessarily, I mean, it was an expensive project, right? But she was also downsizing from a much more expensive home and using that as a chance to help her family, you know, expand their financial resources and, and kind of spread that wealth that she had amassed, you know, over the decades of her own life to now pass it forward to the next generation and stay involved in their lives. I thought that was a really great story and an interesting perspective on, what affordability means to Manny's point, you know, versus them trying to buy two houses next door or her, you know, any other number of scenarios that they could have come up with, it would have been much, much more expensive. So had one more question about, um, is there any, are you guys aware of any city movements towards allowing um, kind of the attached ADU uh, typology that was shown in that original diagram that Drew put up as a kind of a ground floor ADU as an addition off the rear of a primary structure versus as a standalone coach house. Do you guys know of any projects like that? I'm not aware of any, but, or would that even be allowable? I'm not aware of any either. It's carried through a few early documents, the early diagram, and even in the NHS uh, Better Basements uh, document, which I think only came out last year, they do have it as this is one model of ADU, but I don't see as many projects with that. I would, I could see that there has, you know, that's where the practice and the reality of how you review it come into play is like, you know, most reviewers and it's, you know, it's additional FAR, right? right. So how are they negotiating that overall where a basement unit generally isn't additional FAR, um, an attic is, but you have a much bigger structure because rarely do any attic pitches and areas work for you, and plus you're extending a stair, right? Um, so I don't know if there's any examples and I didn't see any kind of pull up in the uh, breakdown that Drew put up from Cityscape. Um, mm-hmm. I do see two other questions about expanding the ADU pilot area. I mean, that's something this administration and this mayor campaigned on. Um, that seems there's strong support for both in DPD and DOH. Um, it's finding the council backers to actually do that. And I think there still is um, very strong support for ADUs. We're in, um, our ADU was in Matt Martin's ward, who is like, was so, I've never met a more excited alder person's office to make ADUs. I mean, they really wanted, and they're helping homeowners proactively try and build them. Um, others, you know, still believe some narratives and stereotypes that it's just going to be, um, you know, party houses and like uh, Airbnbs and all these different things, which led to one of the ADU ordinance exclusions that they can't be used for short term rentals, right? Anything under 30 days. So I think there's some education that might need to be, be had um, in order to get the support from council to expand the pilot program in general, or even the geographic areas that are currently it operates under. 
Thanks for that. Well, we should probably wrap up since we've gone a bit over time, but thanks for hanging in there, those of you who have. Um, this has been great. And this yeah, webinar has been recorded, so it'll be posted to the AI Chicago website um, at some point in time. Madison may be able to speak to that a little bit better, but I did also want to take a really quick opportunity to um, just kind of tell you about one upcoming uh, design for aging uh, program that we're planning in the works right now. It's not up on the calendar yet, but should be very shortly. We're um, planning to host our first ever uh, social networking events. So that's exciting. Uh, it will be May 2nd, and we're actually using it as an opportunity to welcome the housing KC since we have a lot of overlap um, with this very new um, knowledge community in Chicago. So we'll be dual hosting at the J&J &J, uh, showroom in the West Loop. So look for some more information about that. And we'd love to see many of you there in person. So we can talk about future upcoming events and ways to get involved and really just a way to meet others who are interested in aging, housing, and all things related. So thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Thank you, everybody.